narrative towards a soft landing uh, is now at 50% of the narrative you hear in, in, in analysts discussing the future. And they're trying to you know determine the next 24 months. I've never seen so much narrative towards a soft landing, which people claimed only four months ago was impossible. You never get it. Well, it seems you might be getting that. You just don't know. I think to stay the course is to assume that returns on markets will be muted more in that six to eight period, the six to eight percent that I mentioned, and that you want to be very careful. And this is a narrative that a lot of people talked about. Quality matters now. Speculative, unprofitable companies have been absolutely crushed. Those stocks are down 70, 80, 90 percent. I don't anticipate them coming back. People are focusing on what's real and what is actually going to make money. And every once in a while, you get a, a you know a crazy story. Uh, chat GBT, you know, that discussion about an uh, evaluation of $29 billion. Who knows if Microsoft does that deal under what terms? It smells like a royalty deal to me that they're doing. I think they ripped me off from Shark Tank on that thing. They're taking, <laughs> a, they're taking out all the profits and getting half the business. I like that structure. I should charge them a royalty. But at the end of the day, um, the markets are going to be far more muted and you have to focus on balance sheet and quality, just like it was in the old days. And so we're back. It's a full circle. All the speculative froth is gone and profit matters again. Kevin O'Leary is a well-known Canadian entrepreneur, investor, and author. In addition to his role as a familiar face on television, he is possibly most known for his participation as a judge on the television show Shark Tank, in which he assesses and invests in the business proposals presented by prospective business owners. Today, Kevin O'Leary is going to give us a presentation on his macroeconomic outlook in which he will discuss what he anticipates will take place in the months ahead and where he believes the cryptocurrency industry is headed. Also, what difficulties we are going to encounter and how we are going to manage ourselves through those trying moments. In today's video, Richard Hart, one of the most senior analysts working today, will discuss his predictions for the future of the cryptocurrency market and how Bitcoin will fare in that future. Today, he will be discussing the value of Bitcoin, so stay tuned for that. By the way, if you're interested in learning about DeFi and discovering an innovative project, you may want to check out our Master in DeFi course. It's designed to help you understand DeFi in a fun and easy way, with lessons that you can access immediately. Right now, we're offering a special launch discount of 90% off this course will also give you the skills you need to make the most of Pulse Chain when it's released. If you'd like to learn more, just click on the link in the description and become a true cryptopreneur. Now, without wasting any time, let's dive right into the video. Kevin O'Leary share his macroeconomic outlook of coming six to eight months. Discretionary you know, spending what, overall is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is the, the consumer is still flush with capital. Wealthy uh, US uh, consumers, Asian consumers, Middle East consumers have an abundance of free capital. There is inflation, which makes them want to buy hard assets across the board, whether it be high-end pens, watches, cars, art. Um, the, the auctions are, are still very, you know, this is a very unusual recession, if indeed we are in a recession, mm. because you've got so much capital still on the sidelines, over $4 trillion cash. So worldwide. And so, it, you know, this is, this is not your grandfather's recession. Plus you have full employment right now. And the Fed, the big debate is what, what is the terminal velocity of that interest rate? Is it going to be five? Is it going to be 5.1, 5.2, 5.3%? We just don't know yet. Rates are down today after the latest data. So, you know, there's a disconnect between the Fed pounding the table saying we're going to keep raising rates and what long-term bonds are doing. They don't believe them. And so, you know, it's, it's a very unusual situation. The Fed can keep making noise, but it's not working yet. And certainly it's a tight labor market concerned with the Fed's doing. I can only watch what they do and then try and determine how I'm going to put capital work based on what they do, not what they say. Now, one thing about that data, that CPI data, and lots of other analysts are, are talking about this, the housing data has rolled over in there and it's not reflected properly in the CPI 6.5. The real CPI, if we actually were to take true pricing of housing in major markets in the US, whether that be semi-detached, rental units included, standalone uh, homes, certainly office and industrial space, 
that has rolled over and it is it is it is representing a too high an inflation rate inside the CPI because the data they use is 11 to 18 months old. So that's why you're seeing this disconnect in the bond market. Anybody that buys bonds, a fixed income balance sheet investor like me knows exactly why these spreads have tightened, particularly on triple B credits. They don't believe that that inflation is actually 6.5%. Inflation may be as low as 5% right now if we were to true up the data from the housing market. Kevin's strategies for both public and private markets. Got it. I'm, I'm only interested in companies that have a very strong ability to acquire customers profitably. That means they have to understand social media. I like consumer goods and services where they have hundreds of thousands of investors. I'm looking for companies that really understand their markets and are very savvy at marketing. Those are the ones that I do business with. And I'm kind of agnostic to sector. I do tech. I do consumer goods. I did cat DNA testing. Just looked at another business for, for pet supplies. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I get involved in, but it's really about the operator and their understanding on how to acquire customers and sell direct to them. That's where the highest margins are. I'm not interested in just all retail strategy anymore. And there's very often no distributions. However, I've been very creative using royalties, venture debt, convertible debentures, where I get a preference and I get a portion of the cash out of the company every year. That's basically you know, what I've been doing for decades. And, and I'm, I'm known as the royalty guy on that front. And I'm happy and proud of the structures that I brought to the table there. And they work for me. And my returns have been in the, in the private side around 11 to 17%. I mean, that's not the best, but it's not bad. Um, in public markets, there's much more liquidity and returns that you're trying to make 6 to 8% a year and distribute 6% cash. Most of the stocks I own are dividend paying large cap companies, although I do have 20% weighting in mid-cap companies around the $5 billion uh, market cap, but they all pay dividends. Everything that I have on the balance sheet drips cash like a chicken on a spit dripping fat. It's got to drip cash. And that's what I do. I'm the cash guy. And I believe in cash. You can trust cash. You can't lie about cash. And I like cash. So I try and keep myself very close to cash. It makes me feel warm and fuzzy. But but I, I think that's where the discrepancy lies is that with with a publicly traded company you can you have more information to work with to determine whether or not that company is going to continuously generate cash for you in other words be cash flow positive how do you make that assessment with a startup that's much riskier that's why you need a broad portfolio generally I put on seven to ten companies a year into our portfolio we have close to fifty right now and at any one time. You know, some are going out of business because that's the nature of venture capital. And then a few of them, as is happening right now, are being acquired. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for those unicorns. You're looking for those winners. The, the average in, in, since 1950s that's been tracking this data is you make 10 investments, eight of them are living dead or go out of business, and two become huge hits. I'm doing a little better because I have the advantage of television. So about four of ours are profitable, and we make all our money off the four out of 10. So about 40% are really successful. Kevin O'Leary thoughts about regulation. No, I, I agree. There's always going to be fraud. The problem is, let me give you an example. Let's talk about tokens based on, we don't even have to mention what, what exchange, but all the large exchanges, the unregulated global exchanges, incentivize account holders and users to buy their tokens to get discounts on trading fees. It's not new. It's been going on for years. And then they put them on their balance sheet at, at a ridiculous valuation. And if you look at actually who owns these things, 97% of them are owned by the issuer. You don't know who that person is because it's simply a wallet without a name on it. And the other 3% are valuing it at 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 billion dollars. Now, if, if there's a cash run, a cash call back to fiat, back to US dollars on 100 billion dollars, you know that exchange is going to fail. And that's exactly what happened to FTX when a rogue player said, I've got $550 million worth of FTT tokens and I want cash by noon in three hours. Well, of course they don't have 500 million cash. None of them do. And so at the end of the day, this is all something that can just be regulated, regulated out of existence. You, you can't do that. If, if It's a very simple regulation. You can't do that if you're a bank. You can't force people to buy your shares just to open an account. That's ridiculous. Or incentivize them with discounts. That's illegal. All I'm saying is set some rules up, and I think this is going to happen. And I'll tell you how I think this plays out. A passport system is going to be launched by regulators in major markets, U.S., Canada, Switzerland, United Arab Emirates, South American markets. And they're simply going to say, look, 
If you want access to the fiat cash in the regulated bank accounts in this geography, in this country, in this market, you have to be compliant to this passport. And they'll all have the same rules. And if you want to operate, because remember, the one thing about Bitcoin is it doesn't trade in any one geography. It trades around the world 24-7. So if you want to trade it on an exchange in Abu Dhabi or up in Canada or in Mexico or down in South America or here in the U.S., you're going to have to be passported regulated. And that way, if you go offside in any market, they'll just pull your they'll pull all your licenses and then you no longer have access to getting cash in and out of banks. That's how I think they're going to do it. I'm speculating when I say it. But I think you're going to hear more hearings in the Senate and more of this reigning in the cowboy rogue nature of what this has become. It's got to end. People are tired of losing all their money. And frankly, I think regulation doesn't have to be, it's not going to change fraud. It's just going to make it much easier for people to understand what the rules are and get rid of the rogue players. What, in Richard Hart's view, has changed about Bitcoin that makes it a bad bet as a financial asset today? Founders leave coins all the time. Yeah. The coins Cardano. often do fine. Good example. Hoskinson leaving. Over well, I mean, Foundation. I'm not an expert on it. Sure. Yeah. He left <laughs> Ethereum. And so did everybody else. Gavin Wood left Ethereum. Uh, yeah. You know, basically everybody but Vitalik left and Joe Lubin. So, yeah. And I mean, look, I left Bitcoin. Seems to be doing fine. Not really, actually. Yeah. It doesn't seem to be doing fine. It's down if you held it for five years. <laughs> Okay, what are you? Michael your thoughts Saylor on this? bought the top with leverage. Michael Saylor bought the top with other people's money. I called yeah. the top, he bought the top. What an idiot. How do you lose money on the world's best performing asset? How stupid do you have to be? Yeah. You should follow Saylor me says, instead of blocking me. Yeah, whoa, okay. Well, maybe that makes sense. Because I'm doing great and he's right a wrecked now. pleb. No, stay back, Hello. buddy. So here's every Bitcoin maximalist. <laughs> oh, please, God, government, make everything else illegal so that we yeah. can pump. So that we could, we waited from 2017 till 21 to, we waited four years to get our 3X all time high. We went from yeah. 20K to 69K. We have limp wiener, top of the S curve, dying 14 year old tech pumps. But our dumps are the same <laughs> size. Our dumps are the same size. Oh, really? Bitcoin went from 69K to 15.5. Richard, five, and it'll let's be reel 11, you back in. Let's way. reel you back in. I got you, bro. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm, I'm here with you. Okay, I'm no, but like Bitcoin dumps as hard as everything else. Bitcoin dropped 75. Ethereum yeah. dropped 85. And Hex dropped 95. Uh -huh. But Hex went yeah. up a million percent in a year and a half. Maybe a retrace is acceptable. And it's still up 500x now. <laughs> people, people are like yelling. They're like, oh, it's the Ponzi. You're like, hey, uh, Tesla's down like 70%. Facebook's down okay. like six. Like... Everything's down. It's the bear market, guys. What do you think? You, you just you're, you're back to a year and a half ago's price. Everything's back yeah. to a year and a half ago's price. We'll accept Bitcoin. <laughs> Trade is the worst job in the world, according to Richard Hart. A year and a half ago, I told you Bitcoin was going to 10K. Has Bitcoin hit 10K okay. yet? No, it hasn't. There you go. It hasn't hit right. Richard's price target yet. And why wouldn't it hit 10K? Right now, Grayscale Bitcoin's half off. Yep. You can buy encapsulated Bitcoin from Grayscale for half price. And they own 3% of all the Bitcoin. And as a percentage of total available actual like float, it's huge. It's, it's absolutely huge. So you haven't seen the Bitfinex coins liquidated. Yeah. A billion or two there. You haven't seen the Silk Road hackers coins liquidated. Billion there. You haven't seen the Mt. Gox uh, billion or two or three coins uh, handed out yet. The plus token Ponzi coins from China. Not even sure what happened with those ones. None of those have been sold yet. So the dream, the dream is all those centralized counterparties that you don't really want to make rich, the seized yeah. coins that the governments are yeah. all holding, let them sell the bottom. Sell the bottom. Sell 10K. Cool. Let Sailor get liquidated. Ladies, liquor and leverage, homie. That's how you lose your stack. By the way, I'll tell you that trading is the worst thing you can do. How did FTX lose all their money? Trading. How did 3O's Capital lose all their money? Trading. Because they, For sure. they thought they were smarter than me. I didn't lose all my money. I'm doing really good. Really, 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 really good. These guys lost all their money. What do you think of the expert suggestions bearing in mind their level of expertise? Tell us in the comments. We hope we were able to provide some value and helped you to move a step ahead in your crypto journey. Be sure to check out our crypto brand called Cryptopreneur and get yourself the highest quality crypto merch available right now on the market and make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of our content. Till next time, goodbye.